If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistener Elf. Pan Sage wanted to help out here, my daughter's plushie. Shoutouts to you, you are green, and so is this legacy deck. We're rocking elves. Also, shoutouts to Chikorita for the same reason. My daughter loves this one. So when you think an explosive deck in Legacy, you think Charbelcher, you think Oops All Spells, Manalus Dredge, but Elves is that with consistency. It really is, and you have a lot more options. Let's get started with the deck. So for our creatures, we're going to start off with Heritage Druid. Very simply, one mana, tap three untapped Elves you control to make green, 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 and add that to your mana pool. As you can imagine, we'll make more than enough elves early enough to make this effect pretty awesome, and we even have ways to untap our elves, some of which do that on their own. You probably know what I'm talking about if you've seen this in modern. In addition, we have birch lore rangers. Same mana cost, and you only have to tap two elves, but you only get one mana. Granted, it's of any color you choose, and this has the ability to morph, which occasionally matters. I've morphed it before, I've done that on camera. But usually this is just not as good, but again, it makes black or blue or white mana, which occasionally matters. And sometimes you don't have quite enough elves to go off. Next we have Nettle Sentinel, or Nesselronken Kriegerin? Sorry, <laughs> my apologies, Nettle Sentinel, there we go. This one doesn't have the ability to untap on its own. Well, not during the untap step like you normally would, but whenever you play a green spell, ta-da, you get to untap it. As you can imagine, this works super well with Heritage Druid and Birch Lore Rangers. If you get the miracle draw where you have three Nettle Sentinels, then just tap all three, play a card, play a green spell, and then untap all three and keep going and going and going. You can make quite a bit of mana. This deck doesn't go infinite. It isn't like, say, Cloudstone Curio decks in Modern. But you can make more than enough. You don't need infinite. You only need eight. <laughs> Alright, so next we have Deathrite Shaman. <laughs> this is an elf. This is an elf. This is an elf. One drop, two toughness, the Swiss Army Knife. It's this little one mana planeswalker, if you want to think of it that way. Makes mana for us, gains us some life, drains the opponent if we're on that plan, removes things from the graveyard. This is your main board graveyard hate, and you have four, so you have plenty. Next we have good old Elvish Visionary. Sometimes I think this is the most powerful card in the deck. Sometimes it feels like it. Being able to draw a card on an elf, that is more powerful than you've gotten the chance to see so far. We're about to do some crazy things that you can't do in other formats. You can't break Elvish Visionary in Modern like you can in Legacy. Because you don't have access to the card Wirewood Symbiote. Very simply, one mana again. Now this one is not an elf, it's an insect, so won't work with Druid, for instance, or Ranger. Return an elf you control to its owner's hand, untap target creature. This does two things for us right off the bat. For one, you can get, say, an Elvish Visionary back in your hand for more draw power. Two you can untap a mana dork, which with Heritage Druid or Birch Lore Rangers could be any of yours, but of course could just be Deathrite Shaman. So this serves both purposes awfully well. Now of course it is once per turn, but not on your turn. You can do this on your opponent's turn to save your creature. So for example, if they try to Terminus or Wrath your board with the Supreme Verdict, just simply return an Elvish Visionary to try to reload. That is awesome when it happens. I mean, it's not something you want to have to do, but it's nice to have that resilience, that uh, consistency. Resilience, I think, is the right word. And next we have Quirion Ranger. Am I saying that right? Quirion? Whatever. Return of forest you control to its owner's hand, untap target creature. As you can imagine, you don't need too many lands in this deck to make it work. So this effect does a number of things for you. If you already have enough lands, losing one land isn't all that big a deal if you get to untap one of your creatures and continue to combo off on a combo turn. Two, you don't because you don't have too many lands in the deck, 
This lets you, if you don't have another land in your hand, get an extra land drop. Simply tap your land, return it with this effect, and then play it again, and you've netted one mana. Which is always fine, that's where you want to be. And we have three of these because that's how important the effect is. Like Wirewood Symbiote, it's once per turn, but not necessarily your turn. Now, this isn't all of our creatures, but these are all of our engine pieces, I suppose you'd say. These are the ones, most of them one drops as you can see, that you'll use to try to combo off. And when I say combo off, I mean you're going to be drawing a bunch of cards using Glimpse of Nature. It's banned in modern for a reason. Whenever you cast a creature spell, draw a card. That's just for this turn, of course, but that's for a whole turn. So ideally, something like your first card, the first uh, spell you play for the turn is Glimpse of Nature, and then you just try to go off and off and off and off and off and off. It gets to be silly good. So, for example, if you get to draw a card whenever you play an elf, whenever you play a creature, Heritage Druid, Nettle Sentinel, you'll start making mana and using this mana to play more elves and use those elves to draw more cards, and off of the mana you've made you can play more, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. You make a lot of mana and you use that as fuel for the fire. Or I guess since this is a green deck, maybe fertilizer? I don't know. Uh, next we have Green Sun Zenith. Again, banned in modern for a reason. This to me seems like one of those cards that barely makes the cut in modern, but it's because, to a large extent, of a card that we've yet to see in the deck. But it is, it is in here. We'll get to it. So Green Sun Zenith, Sorcery Speed, 1 mana plus X, search your library for a green creature, so it has to be green, with CMC X or less, put it on the battlefield, then shuffle your library, then shuffle this into its owner's library. Interesting how many times you have to shuffle there. Uh, it does give you two different instances of it, but whatever. Okay, so this can go, oh, I'll say it uh, right away, this can go in where X equals zero, you can get Dryad Arbor, because that is a green creature. It is a land, but it's also a creature. So on your first turn, this could be a ramp spell, which I think is the main reason why it's banned in modern. It has that ability that Court of Calling and Collected Company don't have. But this can also get any of your utility elves or your Wirewood Symbiote if you want to try to go off like crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a good card. This is a very good card. And then last but certainly not least, we have Natural Order. Sacrifice a green creature, search your library for a green creature card and put it into play, and then shuffle. Well, you're not usually, unlike Green Sun Zenith, you're not usually casting this to get an engine piece. You're casting this to end the game. But what are you ending the game with? Well, I'm glad you asked. In this version of the deck, I'm taking, I guess, the Ross Merriam approach and running two Craterhoof Behemoths. Shout out to Craterhoof. Awesome looking dude. One of my favorite uh, art concepts, I suppose, in the game. Eight mana, hence my eight earlier. Haste. When it enters the battlefield, creatures you control, including itself, gain trample and get plus X plus X, where X is the number of creatures you control. As you can see, we swarm the field awfully well. We can get a lot of creatures down pretty quickly. And so, Crater Hoof Behemoth, it is possible. It is possible to just have enough elves to make Crater Hoof lethal or pretty close to it. Uh, I've seen Ross Merriam against Reed Duke go from zero creatures on the board to a Crater Hoof Behemoth that got Duke down to one. So that is a that is a thing that you can do with this. It's pretty good. Now there are other ways you can go about doing it. For example, one Crater Hoof, one Progenitus, or one Crater Hoof, one Rurikthar. I'm running two Crater Hoofs. And I'll explain why now while I'm at it. And that is, there are ways to build this deck that aren't as linear and combo oriented. Linear is not the right word. As hard on the combo. However, my preference for running this deck is the same that Ross Merriam has, and I'll try to explain it the way he put it as best I can. In game one, you want to try to be as strong on the combo as, as you can, and then you can side out pieces to side in hate if or as necessary. Uh, there are decks, even decks that have gone 5-0 on Magic Online Leagues, 
that run interaction in the main board, such as Leovold or Ren's Run Packmaster uh, or Umizawa's Jite or Abrupt Decay, but I'm not doing that because I want to try to make it as consistent as I can in game one. The one exception, though, I do want to have one piece of interaction in game one, and that is Reclamation Sage. And this is because Reclamation Sage comes up often enough that I feel that it's warranted. I say I feel, I'm not sure, it depends on your metagame. Reclamation Sage can deal with Blood Moons, yes, can deal with Ensnaring Bridge, yes, it can deal with pieces like those. I actually have it largely because we have Burn in our meta, and Reclamation Sage is a kill spell for Eidolon of the Great Revels. Now if you don't know, Eidolon will wreck this deck. If you aren't already ahead on board, Eidolon essentially just wins the game against you. And the way that it does that is it makes it where any time you would, basically any time you cast a spell, period, notwithstanding Natural Order or Big Enough Green Sun Zenith, you take two. If you need to combo off, you can't do that, but thankfully we have good old Rex Sage here to take care of the problem for us. So it is largely for burn, I admit, and of course some other miscellaneous instances where that might make a difference. However, Ross Merriam doesn't even do that, or at least he didn't when last I checked. That may have changed. But when last I saw an article of his, he did not. He went completely in on the combo, and this is one of the best legacy players in the game today. So I take his word for it. I, I understand that there are, again, 5-0 decks on Magic Online that choose a different path, and they may work in different metas, or they may both work, actually. But I prefer to keep my interaction in the sideboard. Now, for your lands. We're going to start off with something very simple. Two Bayous. This is a Golgari deck at heart. You can use the black, of course, for Deathrite Shaman, and we do have a few sideboard cards that need it, so they're important. In game one, though, it's rare enough that you can actually just go for the forest instead, and to that end, we have two forests. Just to play around Wasteland, it is a thing. Sometimes you can try to bait out Wasteland on a bayou to save a Gaia's Cradle, but often you have the freedom to just choose a basic instead because of how little your deck needs other colors, at least in game one. And I also have two Dryad Arbors. Of course, you can go and fetch these out, or Green Sun Zenith, X equals zero. And because they're that important, we run two. Although, of course, they are summoning six, so be careful about them being your turn one play. Also, because they're summoning sick and you can't use them on the turn, you can't tap them for mana on the turn that they come into play, they're the prime natural order target. If you have to sacrifice a creature, might as well be a useless one, right? Next we have eight green fetches. It doesn't really matter which ones, honestly. Uh, ideally, you do two of each because of Pithing Needle, but beyond that, it doesn't really matter. Maybe you can try to play mind games with your opponent by tricking them into thinking you have, say, blue, so put in Misty's. I don't know, just an idea. Or maybe think, make them think there's a main board Gaddock Teague with Windswept Heath. Eh, it's probably too cute, but it's an option that you have. And next, what I think is the most powerful land in Legacy, with maybe one possible exception. Gaia's Cradle. Doesn't make any green on its own, but it adds green to your mana pool for each creature you control. So at anything after your first land play, this this is huge. It's a legendary land and we run four. That's how important this thing is. Once you get enough elves on the board and you can tap it, ooh, it gets silly. You can get up to that eight mana awfully easily. Now another one that's in strong contention for best land in Legacy very meta-dependent, though, is Cavern of Souls. We have a bunch of elves. Just name elves on this and go to town. One time I named Advisor for a card in the sideboard that I just needed to resolve. It's Gaddock Teague. We'll get there. Now, as for the sideboard, actually, we start off with four Abrupt Decays for when we need that removal, and we need it hard. This is for blue matchups like Delver that play their creature and need to try to protect it, but they can't because this can't be countered. This also could work against Infect, although beware of Vines of Vastwood, 
which certainly is still a thing, and a few other matches. If you need to deal with- or Merfolk, there's another good one. If you need to deal with their creatures, Abrupt Decay is your card. And of course, it's more than just creatures. It can hit any non-land permanent. So if you're being dealt with- or if uh, Ensnaring Bridge is giving you trouble, I guess, comes out of burn sideboards, or some Eldrazi cards like Chalice of the Void, well, there you go. Or Mud. <laughs> mud does it too. Okay. Um, next we have Cabal Therapy. <laughs> this is probably a little excessive. I'm running four Cabal Therapy. Some number of these could be replaced with Thoughtseize. You could go to, I mean, three and three, or if you're keeping... I only have one. I'll get to that in a second. Anyway, this and Thoughtseize are vying for your hand attack cards, and they have their own advantages and disadvantages. If you really know the decks in Legacy and you know the meta, then naming something in the blind with Cabal Therapy, which of course you have to do in this deck because you don't have Gitaxian Probe, can be... it's easier or it's less difficult. I think that this is either this or Brainstorm, the most skill-intensive card in Magic. At least in Legacy. Partially because you have to know what your opponent has in every single deck, and you have to be able to try to figure, probabilistically, what should be named, what's the right card to name. Okay, so, with all that said, part of the reason I chose Therapy over as many copies of Thoughtseize is because this has Flashback Sack a Creature. Well, we have a lot of cheap creatures, and if we need to, we can play it once, even if we guess incorrectly it's whatever, and then sacrifice a creature, pay no additional mana, and then flash it back. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> if our opponent's on combo, sometimes that can just shred their hands. Or if you need to make sure that you get rid of counter magic first before you try to go off, name something like Force of Will or Counter Spell or Spell Pierce or Daze or what have you. Those are things that you can now do because you have Cabal Therapy, and it itself plays well against counter magic because you get to cast it twice for the low, low cost of one mana and a creature. So it's difficult, it's not like Thoughtseize where they can counter it and the information isn't there, you're going to play it again. Now for the burn match, we have an Elder Scale Worm. Natural order into this as quickly as you possibly can. Burn can't deal with this thing. They just, they can't, they simply can't. A little note with this card out, it does say that as long as you have 7 or more life, damage that would reduce your life total to less than 7 reduces it to 7. In other words, don't fetch with Elder Scale Worm out. That's not damage, that's life loss. And once you're below 7, you need to replay it in order to get the, in order to get your life total back to 7 stabilized. At that point, if you fetch, the burn player can beat you. But this is just my answer to burn. Also, let's see. How many times is 7 in here? 1, 2, 3... Four, five, six, seven, and then sevens in the mana cost. Is it in the collector number too? Aha! So it is one sixty-seven. Okay, so seven is actually featured on this card more than seven times. I'm afraid. Even so, st just trivia with T1 Glistener Elf. Next, we have the aforementioned Gadok Teague. So great is his wisdom and spirit that many who have met him say they couldn't cast a single Force of Will for the rest of the game. Admittedly, this is... We, you want to try to cast your Green Sun Zenus in Natural Orders first. It's a little bit of an anti-synergistic card with those. And as a result, you'll take uh, one of them out, say a Natural Order, in order to side in Gaddock Teak. Sorry about the non-bow, but sometimes this is a necessary evil. And of course, you'll have to Green Sun Zenith for it, or use Birchlore Rangers, because you don't have anything that makes white mana other than Cavern of Souls. And that is a hard place to be. Now, of course, you could have a Savannah in the deck somewhere, and that would give you the ability to run sideboard cards like Rest in Peace or Stony Silence or Swords to Plowshares, something like that. Path to Exile? I guess that works against decks with no basics. But I'm not opting for that. I'm using Green Sun Zenith and Birch Lore to get there. Next we have another one that doesn't use just our two colors. We have Leovold, Emissary of Trest. Oh, fun. Now this one, though, you can cavern and name elves for and be fine. So you have that additional route. 
Line one reads, don't brainstorm. <laughs> line two reads, don't target anything I have. This doesn't help against wrath spells, but literally it shut it, well not literally, it shuts down the card brainstorm. You know, don't draw any cards and put two cards back. We'll draw one card if it's cast on your turn. That's not usually where the opponent wants to be. And if they can't dig for their answers, they're probably not going to find their answers. You see why this card is so good. <laughs> so good. Alright, and of course it's a 3-3, three, three, so that has a big enough body, it's nothing to laugh at. If they start wasting or hitting your creatures with swap removal, you'll just draw cards and draw cards and draw cards. I actually care less about that than shutting down my opponent's ability to draw themselves into a good spot. Leovold, I think, is therefore great against the Miracles deck. Okay. Next we have Scavenging News. This is more Graveyard Hate. In addition to Deathrite Shaman, this is our Tarmogoyf, I suppose. It deals with cards in the graveyard in sort of a reverse way of Tarmogoyf, but it serves as that large mid-range threat, and actually gains you some life, too, so keep that in mind. For some matches, that's relevant. Next we have the Singleton Thoughtseize, which perhaps should be more in place of Cabal Therapy, perhaps, or take some other <laughs> some of these cards out. I'm actually not so sure about some. <laughs> these might not be right. But Thoughtseize for the combo decks. Just gives us the ability to hopefully uh, shut them out for just a little bit. Next we have Umizawa's Jite. Oh, fun. Stick this card and make decks like Elves, or not, well, yeah, Elves, it, it breaks the mirror, and infect, cry. <laughs> Sometimes even against, for instance, death and taxes because of how much one toughness they have running around. Mom can't protect against a Jite after all. This is a good card. You may have heard. It's a good card. It's only one of, though. We have enough draw power that we might be able to get into it. Hopefully you just have it, though. And you have enough creatures that if one gets destroyed next turn, just throw it on another. You'll be fine. Now, one of the biggest weaknesses, and this next card, it took me a long time to realize why it's in here, but one of the biggest weaknesses of Elves is Wrath Spells. This is why the Miracles match is so atrocious. They run Terminus and Supreme Verdict. Okay, so how do you beat that? Well, one is you outrace them, but again, this is a counterspell deck, so easier said than done. But another way is you don't go wide, or at least you don't use too many cards to go wide. But wait a minute, how does your deck do that? Don't you need to invest heavily? And that is one of the reasons why Elves is such a hard match against Miracles. Because on the one hand, to beat them, you need to go in quickly enough. On the other hand, if you go too far in, well, you can get punished super hard with a Terminus or a Verdict. So then, what's the answer? Well, this is one that I've seen tried out, and I am not sure if it quite makes the cut, but I like it for this purpose. Rins run Packmaster, so 4 mana, 5-5, five, five. you do have to champion an elf, which means when it enters the battlefield, you have to sacrifice an elf. Don't worry though, when this leaves play, that card will return, so it actually kind of plays around Wrath just a little bit. Uh, but this gives you the ability to put out 2-2 two, two green wolf creatures with death touch. In other words, if your fear is that you're going to go too wide and get punished hard by a terminus, well, Rin's Rung Packmaster helps you in two ways. One, it is one card that keeps making a presence on the board, namely 2-2 two, two death touchers. That means that if the opponent deals with just this card, they still have the wolves to deal with. Uh, it just, in other words, it taxes spot removal and forces them to have to use mass removal. If they do that, though, whatever elf you champion is going to come back. Hopefully, you get to champion an elvish visionary so that when it comes back, you draw a card and you're one up. Now, I'm sure that there's more utility to it than that, and people who play the deck more than I should be able to help you out with that. I know that at least one good Reddit thread exists on just this card itself, explaining why it's good, or why it's at least playable. <laughs> and there are a number of these that, ag again, I've seen Leovold in the main board, I've seen Scooz in the main board a good bit, I've seen Ren, run pa Ren runs Packmaster in the main board, I'm not running Bruric Thar, but you could, that is certainly an option. 
For those that don't know, one reason why you'd run Ruric Thar is so that if you're playing against, say, Storm, some sort of heavy combo deck, if you aren't quite able to finish them off with Craterhoof Behemoth, you can still finish them with Ruric Thar, or not finish them, you can keep them from winning with Ruric Thar and then you'll win on the next turn or two. In other words, it's a, a safety button, an emergency button. Yeah, if you don't quite have the ability to finish them, you can still get them into sort of a lock. And because Elves doesn't perform extremely well against decks like Storm, uh, it's fast enough to race them, but those decks can outrace Elves. It gives you something that you can do. Alright, and that's Elves. I hope that you've enjoyed it, and I will see you later. Take care, Magic Community. Bye-bye. No.